welcome today to today's Authors at Google event. It's a great pleasure to have Dean uh, Karnassus with us today. Um, Dean's an absolutely amazing athlete. Uh, love for the outdoors. Pushes his body and mind to almost inconceivable limits. Um, among his many accomplishments, he's won a 135-mile ultramarathon across Death Valley in 120 degrees. Uh, he ran a marathon to the South Pole in negative 40. Uh, he's climbed Half Dome, swam across San Francisco Bay, uh, mountain biked for 24 hours straight. Uh, he surfed the gigantic waves off the coast of Hawaii, uh, and he's a, an accomplished windsurfer. He's also recently run 50 marathons in all 50 states uh, in 50 consecutive days, finishing with the New York City Marathon, which he completed in three hours and 30 seconds. Uh, perhaps his greatest accomplishment is his ability to inspire and help others to uh, be the best that they can be. Um, Dean values the importance of overall strength uh, and fitness and has traveled the country meeting uh, and running with people of all ages to promote the importance of physical exercise and good diet. Uh, for his effort, he's been recognized by Time Magazine as one of the top most influential people in the world. He's here today to, talk, to speak about his book, 5050, Secrets I Learned Running 50 Marathons in 50 Days and How You Too Can Achieve Super Endurance. So a little bit about the book. 5050 goes beyond the incredible story of these 50 marathons. It's really a first-hand account of what happens when your body defies all of its limitations. Uh, and it's the fascinating story of what it's like to push the limits of strength under very, very grueling conditions. Uh, Dean will be discussing his work, the book, and his experiences. Um, he'll then take questions at the end of the talk. Uh, we are video conferencing live to offices in San Bruno, Kirkland, Irvine, Seattle, Seattle, uh, San Francisco, Santa Monica, Chicago, New York, and Sydney. So if you have any questions at the end, please do use the microphones. Um, and if you've got questions from the remote offices, uh, we will have uh, a Dory set up at go slash uh, Dean Carzan. Uh, <laughs> Carnassus, uh, and you guys can add your questions there. Uh, so, with that, please join me in welcoming Dean Carnassus. Thanks, Greg. I, obviously, I don't pay him enough, but uh, thank you for that uh, very glamorous introduction. And uh, my last name is pronounced Carnassus, but I mutilate it all the time, so it's no problem. Um, you know, I wanted to start by just saying uh, what an honor it is to be standing here today. Uh, as a Bay Area guy, I've long admired um, your company, and I think it's tremendous what you've gone through and how you've grown it so quickly. Uh, but, you know, think, a couple things have changed since I launched my first book. Um, one is that, you know, some of the marathons I said I hadn't done, like New York City, I've now done that a couple times. Um, another thing that's really important that's changed is Google Maps. Because this is, you know, when I was on the show, we didn't have that kind of technology yet. And I used to have to call on a cell phone to get a pizza delivered. Now I can just locate it really easily, and they'll actually talk me through it. So that's changed a lot. Um, you know, people say, "What do you eat when you're out there?" Well, you know, pizza is a favorite. And you know, how, how do you eat a pizza when you're running? Well, I've learned a couple important life lessons out on the road. Uh, one is you get the Hawaiian style. Pepperoni's too spicy. So you get the Hawaiian style pizza. Uh, you ask them not to slice it, and you order the thin crust, and then you roll it into a big burrito like a log. <laughs> oh, it's so sloppy. It gets all over you, but it's delicious. <laughs> and I've also I recently uh, uh, broadened my roadside palate and ordered a Chinese takeout on the run. I got the Kung Pao tofu and just drank it out of the box. And it was good, because there's salt in there, so you get a lot of sodium for uh, electrolytes. Uh, the only downside with Chinese is that I was uh, hungry an hour later. So. But you know, I want to talk to you a little bit about my most recent book, which is called 5050, about uh, running 50 marathons in all 50 US states in 50 consecutive days. And I want to start by asking you, with a show of hands, how many of you in here have actually run a marathon before? Let's keep your hands up. Let's give them a round of applause. That's tremendous. 
Now keep, keep those hands up proudly. Keep them up proudly. Because I want to give you a statistic. Um, did you know that one in four Americans suffer from some form of mental illness? <laughs> so look around. If the three of your seatmates don't have their hands up, I think we got that one in four. <laughs> um, but not to worry. Uh, that was actually the same reaction I got from the first person I told I wanted to run 50 marathons in 50 states in 50 days. They said, what are you, nuts? And that was from my dad. <laughs> and then my doctor weighed in, and he gave me the certificate. It says, this man is certifiably insane. <laughs> Start running. <laughs> but I didn't think I was insane. I just thought I had the ultimate family vacation idea. You know, when my kids got old enough, I thought, you know, it would be a dream of mine to put them in a motorhome, tour this great country, and, you know, maybe do a little running when I was out there. Well, they got old enough, and unfortunately, they only had 50 days off school. We wanted to see the whole country, so the 50-50-50 was born. And essentially, it was uh, an incredible experience, primarily because other runners joined me along the way. It wasn't just about me. It was about bringing people together, about uniting people, um, and also that I had my family there to share it with me. Um, now, when people hear that I did 50 marathons in 50 states in 50 consecutive days, you know, there's a couple questions that pop to mind. Uh, you know, one, are you nuts? Which I think I already answered that question. Uh, but two is like, how, how do you do this? I mean, for any of you that have run a marathon, you know that marathons are scheduled on the weekends. In Iowa, on Tuesday, for instance, there's not a marathon. So how do you run a marathon on Tuesday? Well, what we did is we ran um, eight of the marathons that were quote unquote, live events, like Chicago Marathon. Uh, the final marathon was New York City Marathon. I uh, ran the Marine Corps Marathon. And this was with you know, 35,000 other runners. Uh, for the 42 other marathons, what we did is we contacted the race directors for some of the most prominent marathons in, the, in those states. And we asked them if they would recreate their marathon the day we were in town. And when I say recreate, that meant uh, that we'd set up an official starting line, uh, follow their sanctioned certified course, and actually finish at their finish line. So that we had documentation that we actually completed the actual course, and we had a start time and a legitimate finish time. And that's how we were able to do uh, 50 marathons in 50 days. Uh, now, how did they close the course, quote unquote? Some of the marathons, for those of you who run marathons, you know that they'll hold the whole 26.2 mile course closed during the, during the event. And they'll keep the roads closed for, until the cutoff time, which is seven, in my case, sometimes eight hours. But they'll hold the entire road closed. Uh, for us, they, they couldn't do that, obviously. We were a smaller group. And we were running in places like Dallas on Wednesday. And the marathon route goes through downtown Dallas in rush hour traffic, as well as it goes up on a freeway. Uh, so what we had was a police escort to keep us runners in what they were calling a pod and we'd run through intersections, and they'd close down. They'd do these roaming road closures, so they'd close the intersection as we ran through. They'd close down the freeway just temporarily as we ran up on the freeway and ran back down. And that's how we were able to actually keep the, uh, the marathon route the way it was without closing the road. Now, those of you who have done these sort of group runs, you know that not everyone runs at the same pace. You also know that um, periodically nature calls, right? Um, during a marathon, they have little porta johns set up along the way. Uh, for us, um, we didn't have this luxury. So I devised this uh, numeric number system that I use with the kids when we're on road trips. And that is, you know, six is getting up there, seven, eight, okay, start looking for a bush. Nine is the panic range. <laughs> so people would be yelling at us as we're running, okay, I'm at eight, I'm at eight. <laughs> I thought they were talking about pace at first, but no. <laughs> So that's how we did the 50 marathons in 50 states. Um, you know, the other question people have, how, how did you hold up? I mean, 50 marathons in 50 days is insane. I've run one marathon. I can barely walk the next day. How did you do this 50 days over? You know, it's, it's funny. Um, my body actually grew stronger over 50 days. And the final marathon, which was the New York City Marathon, was my fastest of all 50. It was uh, three hours and, and 30 seconds which you know, is, a, is a respectable marathon time on its own. And I think that uh, the human body has this remarkable ability to rejuvenate, um, to recuperate, and to respond to a load that's put on it. Because when I started this endeavor, I thought I'm either going to end up in a wheelchair 
or I'm going to make it to the finish line. And I actually ended up uh, adapting to the, the load that was put on my body every day, and it grew stronger over time. Um, were there low points? Yeah, I mean, there were some very, very low points. I, I won't deny that. Um, we started with the Lewis and Clark Marathon in St. Louis, which seemed kind of apropos because it was the 200th year anniversary of the Lewis and Clark Expedition. And we started heading west. So we hit state by state until we got here in California where I ran the San Francisco Marathon. And then I swam to Hawaii. And, <laughs> this is a joke. I wanted to swim, but I didn't have enough time. So we flew to Hawaii. And that marathon in Hawaii was brutal. It was one of those tropical days where the trade winds aren't blowing. And it was about 90 degrees and about 95% humidity. And I mean, that humidity was just sucking down in on us as we were running. It was really tough. And I thought, this is a brutal marathon. We finished. I wanted to go surfing. And my crew went let me. They said, we got to catch this red eye. So we had to you know, get right back to the airport. We caught a red eye to Phoenix, Arizona, for the next marathon. And the next day, it was 104 degrees in Phoenix and bone dry, about 5% humidity. So at the halfway point of that marathon, it was what they call an out and back course. I had some real doubts if I was going to make it. I was not, not there. I wasn't lucid. I was kind of hallucinating a little bit. I was seeing double vision. And I thought, this is insane. How, how am I going to make this? Um, I've got, you know, this, this is marathon 19. Even if you can get to the finish of this, you've got 31 marathons in front of you. And, you know, at that point, I think I learned a valuable lesson. And the lesson was, don't think about what's in front of you. It's too daunting. Take this larger task, this seemingly impossible task, and break it down into smaller, more manageable, bite-sized pieces. And I think that's a good business lesson as well. So what I did at that point is said, you know what, I know what I need to do. What, I, what I'm going to do is make the commitment every morning to do the best that I can. When I wake up that morning, I'm going to give it my all that day. And at some point, it got so granular where I said, I can't even, I can't even envision getting to the end of this marathon. What I'm going to do is I'm going to do my best in the next foot strike. I'm going to do the best in the next foot strike. And I was really in the moment, just literally not thinking about anything in the future, just doing my best at that point in time. And I think that's how I was able to hobble through uh, 50 consecutive marathons. So overall, it was, you know, it was quite a tremendous experience. Um, you know, a reporter asked me yesterday, he said, you know, what are your expectations for your second book? Do you want to sell a million copies? Yeah, that'd be nice. Sure, who wouldn't? You know, what author would want to sell a million copies? But you know, that, that's not the goal of me writing this book. Um, my ultimate goal for this book is that uh, any of you that happen to read it, uh, you turn that last page more inspired uh, to capture your dreams than you were before you opened the book. And if I can accomplish that, I'll be forever satisfied with my new book, 5050. So um, to all of you and to all of you out there, which I've been to many of your cities, including Sydney. I used to live in Sydney. And I'll be back in Australia in October, and we're going running. Um, <laughs> thanks very much. I really appreciate your time. I know a lot of you would rather be out there running right now. And I appreciate your time. And I think I have. Um, a bit for some Q&A. So I'll take some questions, and I'll certainly sign anyone's book who'd like me to. Thank you. No questions? I can't imagine. Yeah. Oh, when? Hello. I see a green light. Um, I'll just yell. So I'm considering doing an ultra. I've done a few marathons. So what's the difference? Be oh, there you go. What's the difference between um, the feeling you get when you run a full marathon and the feeling you get running 50 miles, which is probably nothing for you, but <laughs> okay. So the question is, what's your name? Um, I'm Gail. Gail's is um, looking to run an ultra marathon. And first of all, can I talk you out of it? <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, you know, I should start by uh, defining what an ultra marathon actually is. Um, my son Nicholas recently came to me and he said, Dad, you know, what does ultra mean? You know, now I know a handful of words in Latin, but ultra is one of the words I know. So I thought I'll impress this little guy kind of with my vast linguistic mastery. And I said, Nicholas, uh, in Latin, ultra means beyond. And he said, oh, uh, beyond what, Dad? 
And I said, you know, beyond normal. And he said, oh, I, I thought crazy meant beyond normal. <laughs> <laughs> That's enough Latin for today, Nicholas. Uh, but basically, ultra means anything beyond a marathon. So all marathons are 26.2 miles. And I can't tell you how many reporters across the country asked me how far my marathon would be today. <laughs> One guy said, well, all marathons are 26.2 miles. And he said, so is this your longest? I said, oh, man, I tried to get my crew to come up with the shortest marathons, but they all seem to be 26.2 <laughs> miles, buddy. But an ultra marathon is beyond that. So ultra marathoners run 50 kilometers, 50 miles. It sounds like you want to take on a, a 50 miler, 50 miles, sometimes beyond that. And I think the biggest difference when you go to that next level is that a lot of people um, running marathons are racing marathons. So they're really looking to, you know, especially if they've completed one, to PR, which is a personal record, to beat their previous time. So they're out you know, training, watching their clock when they're running. They're looking at their mile splits and things like that. With the ultra marathon, a lot of people define victory as just finishing. They don't care what their time is. They want to make it before the cutoff. And that is the biggest challenge. And I think there's a lot more spirit in the ultra marathon because people band together. It's not so much racing, competing against someone. It's more seeing if you can do it, being the best that you can be. So the mind, mindset shifts in ultra marathons from I'm going, to, you know, I'm going to beat my previous time or I'm going to crack four hours to I'm going to make it. I'm going to get to that finish line. And I think it's just a, it's a great thing because it's, some of these races are so daunting. I do a race called the Badwater Ultra Marathon. It goes across Death Valley in the middle of summer. And I just did it uh, a few weeks ago. It was 122 degrees. Um, half the field doesn't even finish. You know, and those that do are forever changed by the experience. So go get it, Gail. Yeah. Um, so this is maybe a confusing question, but like, do you work out when you're not doing the marathons and stuff, I mean? <laughs> like, how do you stay in shape? Do you watch what you eat? Do you actually go to the gym? Like, or do you just run every well, day? Well, I, you know, I try to exercise regularly, and I watch what I eat. <laughs> Take my multivitamins. <laughs> Um, you know, I, I, being a West Coast guy, I love the outdoors. So I, I windsurf. Uh, I live in San Francisco, and the windsurfing is really good there. I windsurf. I surf. I mountain bike, uh, Mount Tam all the time. Uh, I rock climb. I snowboard in the winter. So I do a lot of cross training. I'm not really big at going to the gym. Uh, but, you know, just from these sports that I love, I, you get some, you know, upper body strength as well. But I encourage people, you know, don't, I think you guys are the best at this. Don't compartmentalize what you do as, you know, here's my workout. I got to go to a gym for one hour and then I'll be done with it. Make it part of your lifestyle. Incorporate it into a healthy, active living, kind of like your job. I mean, it's, it's your passion. It's your life. Go for a run. Come back to the office. You know, do your emails. Uh, what I do at home, I've, I've got a desk that uh, is at about waist level. So I, I never sit. I, if I sit, I fall asleep. So I never sit, and I cycle, you know, as I'm answering emails and phone calls and stuff, I cycle between sets of push-ups, sit-ups, and pull-ups just throughout the day. I mean, just periodically. If I've got a 15-minute break, I'll do a quick routine. And I just feel great about it. I mean, it's part of the lifestyle. It makes, I think it helps me perform better in my job as well as, you know, on the field of play. So does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah. OK. Okay, I read your first book and definitely really, really enjoyed it. I thought it was really inspiring. But when well, I told this... Uh, you read my first book? Your first book, yes, it's yes. inspiring? Inspiring. So a little people crazy. Should out, people should go out and buy it. But no. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> thanks. So, thanks. so it, it was Thank definitely... You. It was, Thank you. It, it kind of opened my eyes to the, these extreme sports that people actually can do. And it, yeah. the, the thing when I tell people about this book, and specifically my, my family... Um, they, they, they say, okay, this is great, but this isn't really sustainable. And my question is, do you see over the years, because you started doing this over like 15 years ago, do you see your body changing? And how many more years do you think you can still continue doing this? And, and or, you know, what sort of thoughts do you have about doing this long, long term and if it's sustainable? Yeah. I mean, those are legitimate questions, and uh, I think I'll start by saying if I, th if I thought I was doing any harm to my body, uh, I wouldn't do it. I mean, I thought I, if, if I thought I was damaging myself, I just would stop. Uh, but, you know, when you look at kind of the physiological parameters for health, 
Uh, my cholesterol is under 100. You know, I have very low blood pressure. Uh, my resting heart rate is about 38, 39. Unless I've had a good cup of coffee, then it goes up to the mid 40s. But um, you know, my body fat's about 4%. And when I started, you know, running and exercising, doing more cardiovascular, I noticed just a nat and eating better as well. I noticed just a natural change in my body composition. Uh, my weight didn't change too much, but my uh, lean muscle, you know, my lean muscle mass compared to body fat shifted dramatically. So I lost a lot of body fat, gained more uh, lean muscle mass. You know, people say, how, how long can you keep doing this? I tell people my finish line's a pine box. <laughs> that, you know, as long as I'm passionate about it and as long as I still love it, I'll keep doing it. And, you know, if I wake up one morning, I'm like, ah, I don't like running anymore, I'll, I'll just stop. But um, you know, so far, I feel like I'm getting stronger as I get older. Um, definitely getting a little slower, I'll admit that. But I feel like my body is still getting stronger. And you know, the other thing that I've really noticed is that um, my pain threshold has changed tremendously. And I think I've just overwhelmed my neurons to the point that they don't respond anymore. But <laughs> I seem to be able to tolerate pain a lot better now than I, than I could when I first started. So. I'll see how far I can go. I mean, you know, it's, it's amazing. I go to some of these marathons, you see guys and women, 60s, 70s, even 80s, and they're strong. They look great. And, you know, for those of you that run, I, I, there's quite a buzz created by a recent study uh, that came out from Stanford, this long-term uh, epidemiological study of like 550 people uh, that started in the 70s with the running, you know, craze. And they had predicted, oh, you know, runners are going to have a higher incidence of death higher incidence of you know, arthritis, hip, knee replacement, and just the opposite was true. Yeah, so, of course, the researcher, the lead researcher was a runner. <laughs> Might be a little jaded, but yeah. Um, so before I ask the question, is it true, I read somewhere that you've done 350 consecutive miles now? It, yeah, so the furthest I've run uh, consecutively has been uh, 350 miles over 81 hours and 44 minutes. So do you, do you listen to music? Do you have people talk to you? I mean, how do you stay mentally sane for 81 hours of, of continuous running? You know, dur during, the, I, during these, like when I'm training, I listen to music a lot. And I also listen to books on tape. So I listen to a lot of books. Um, I also, I also write when I run. So I carry a digital recorder, and I finally have some of my clearest thoughts when I'm, when I'm running, so I dictate into it. But during these races, you know, one thing I really like about it is that there's solidarity of focus, that you're thinking of one thing for a pretty extended amount of time, and that is making it. So you know, all efforts are kind of uh, around the, the goal of, of getting to the finish line. So you know what's expected of you. I mean, it's, you know, life is ambiguous. The rules change. You're never sure if you're going the right direction. With these long runs, even if it's 350 miles, uh, you know what's expected. I mean, there's a starting point and there's a finish line. And you get from point A to point B and you succeed. If you don't, you fall short. And to me, that, that clarity, that crystal clarity is really nice. Because my life, as I'm sure all of your lives are, very frenetic. And you're just bombarded with noise and stuff coming in. And, I, I just need some time to process it all. And so I, I like to go out on these long runs and kind of work through everything. Um, I've talked to mountain climbers that have said the same thing. They've said, you know, preparing for the expedition, it's frenetic. I mean, there's, you know, there's coordination of supplies and, you know, logistics and everything. But once they're on the mountain, this, this crystal clarity emerges because they know what's expected of them. They get to the summit and they make it. They don't, they fall short. So even though I was running for, you know, close to 82 continuous hours, it was just one thought. You know, listen to your body, uh, listen to your crew, you know, do what you need to do to keep going forward. And to me, that's kind of cleansing. That's almost clarifying. Um, the only thing with that run that was a little bit bizarre is that on the third night without sleep, I really started falling asleep. <laughs> and I'd wake up running down the middle of the road thinking, this is dangerous, this is crazy. Uh, I was just willing myself to continue but something happened that was really interesting. The second time I fell asleep when I was sleep running, I, I woke up and I was kind of rejuvenated. Like, wow, that was a nice cat nap. <laughs> and I subsequently had this guy contact me and he said, you know, tell me what's going on, Dean. I read your story. Tell me what's going on. So he wanted me to describe the elements that were, were happening in this third night. And I said, well, I've got this reflective flasher going. 
He's like, okay, so your vision's getting engaged, and, and I'm running. And so he said, you got that continuous monotone thud of your foot strikes, so your auditory's being engaged. You're not actually asleep. You're putting yourself into a trance. You're in a transcendental state. I'm like, oh, have I entered the twilight zone? You know, what's going on? He's like, no, no, no. I, can, I was the personal trainer for Bruce Lee, and I can train you on how to do this. You could uh, sleep on the run, wake up refreshed, and who knows? You could run six, seven, a thousand miles maybe. And I stopped returning his emails. I was like, <laughs> no part of that, yeah. Uh, how many days a week do you run, and how long usually? Um, that's a good question. I, if I could, I'd run seven days a week, but inevitably it ends up being you know, five or six days a week just because of my schedule. And how far, you know, as far as weekly mileage, it, again, it, it's, it could be 50 or 60 miles one week. The next week it might be 250 miles. So it really varies. I don't run a set amount, nor do I run the, the same course every day. How about miles daily? What's your average? Yesterday you I ran about, uh, about a marathon. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> but I had two runs, one in the morning, and then I did a book signing, then I, I went for another run and did another one. One of my favorite things to do is, you know, I've got a family, and I've got a son who's probably a little bit younger than you, and, and I always put them first. I mean, they're my number one priority. But I like to combine, uh, you know, trips and stuff with running. So uh, we live in San Francisco, and there's this hot springs up in Calistoga that we love to go to as a family. Um, so I'll tuck the kids in on Friday night, at, you know, and read to them in bed, and then about 8 o'clock at night, uh, I'll head north. And the, the run I do is about 75 miles to get up there, the route I follow. So I'll run um, all night up to Calistoga. And, and then my wife will get the kids up on Saturday morning, and they'll drive up, and we'll meet for breakfast. <laughs> and then we'll just hang out for the weekend. Wow. OK. <laughs> Hi, um, a, fr a friend of mine knew you were going to come, so he texted me this email. He texted me this uh, question. <laughs> now, earlier you said that you didn't get injured because of your good biomechanics, but he's wondering, what do you do to avoid it? Uh, besides the biomechanics, do you, besides the good biomechanics, do you do you attribute it to the core strength you have from all the push-ups and sit-ups that you do, um, and do you do yoga? Okay. Uh, yeah, I, I think, you know, I, I say this to people all the time. I, I really do not believe I'm unique or different or gifted in any sort of way. I don't think I have any special talents other than that I'm passionate about what I do. I, I love what I do. And I, you know, I think that anyone in this room, if you had the same commitment, the same devotion, uh, you could run 50 marathons in 50 states I, in 50 days. I really believe that. But you have to commit to it, obviously. Um, some people say, no, you've got some sort of advantage going. I mean, I think the only thing I might have going in my favor is that I do have um, good biomechanics. My alignment is really good. I don't pronate or supinate when I run. Uh, my foot strikes is pretty, pretty honest, as they say. And that's, that's hereditary. I mean, that's nothing I've trained for. I'm 100% Greek. And my dad always insists we're from the same village as Pheidippides. <laughs> I'm like, Dad, we grew up in LA. I mean, what village are you talking about? Uh, but I think, you know, I, 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 I cross-train with mountain biking. I think having strong quadriceps and just a strong overall body is really helpful. Because I run with a lot of guys that are elite marathoners that are much faster than me. And, you know, after about 30, 40 miles, they start to break down, and I seem to be able to keep going. Um, you know, the other thing, well, and I do uh, Bikram yoga. Yeah, I also do Bikram yoga. Um, the other thing is that I, uh, I've worked with a company called The North Face, which some of you might know. They're here in the Bay Area. And we designed a, uh, a line of footwear together. So uh, we got into this footwear lab with these guys up in Portland. And we came up with a shoe that actually uh, has no laces. Because the one thing I noticed is that when you're running, especially when you're running a marathon, your foot expands and contracts a whole lot. I mean, even when you're walking throughout the office, through the course of a day, your foot's expanding and contracting. And at some point, you just tire of retying and retightening and re-loosening your shoelace. And you either run or walk with a shoe that's too tight or too loose. 
So I saw this piece of mountaineering technology. It was called the BOA system, like a BOA constrictor. And I saw it, and I thought, you know, I think that can be adapted to a running shoe if we just strip it down and lighten it up. So after about a year and a half of refinement, uh, we came up with this shoe that actually doesn't have any laces to tie. It's got this uh, ratchet on the back. And this is how, if you want to tighten your shoe, that's how you tighten it. And if you want to loosen it, you just pop it out. And that's how you loosen it. So now, you know, when I'm running, if I want to micro adjust my shoe, before it used to be, you know, stopping, sitting down, retying. Now I'm just running along. And I just keep going. So that, that's really changed a lot of, of my running as well, having that, that shoe. It's, te it's technology as well. The guy who, um, who came up with the BOA system actually uh, was the, the inventor of angioplasty. It's that same technology kind of snaking through. Just through a shoelace versus someone's <laughs> heart. <laughs> uh huh. Um, Dean, it was really interesting to hear you talk about your struggles in uh, your 19th marathon in Phoenix. I actually, you, you ran by me in your 21st marathon uh, towards the end, and you looked remarkably good. So it's interesting to, to hear those struggles. But uh, one thing I noticed. St. George, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. One thing I noticed when you ran by me was you were surrounded by a group of, of runners that were um, with you, and I thought uh, perhaps. You had uh, a couple of stories of folks that had latched onto you or run with you at some point during, during the, the time that you'd like to share with us, maybe kind of inspirational or funny or something like that. OK. Thanks. Well, you know, that's a, uh, I'm sorry I passed you, by the way. Uh. <laughs> you should have tripped me. Yeah. You should have helped me. <laughs> I had pizza in my back pocket, yeah. <laughs> Um, you know, th those 50 days were, it was like a lifetime's worth of experience, you know, crammed into 50 days. It was just unbelievable, the people I met and the stories I heard. Uh, I had a movie come out recently, and I don't know if anyone got to see it, because it, it was kind of a limited rollout. But I had a movie come out, and it kind of captured, it was a documentary of those 50 days. Maybe I can show it here one day at Google. Um, but it, it, yeah, some of it's on YouTube, yeah. Uh, you know, so some of the people I met, I mean, uh, there was, most of the races had about 50 or 60 other runners with me. South Dakota, Deadwood, South Dakota just had one runner. I mean, we were out in the middle of nowhere. And I start running with this woman, and she, you know, over time, over miles, starts telling me her story. Well, um, she had, it was her 50th marathon she'd ever run on that day with me. And she said, it's special for me. And I said, well, you know, her name was Amy, but she goes by Amos. I said, tell me why, Amos. And she said, well, uh, four years ago, I was diagnosed with, with terminal cancer, terminal breast cancer. And I licked it. And after I licked cancer, I said, you know what? Not only am I going to beat cancer, I'm going to become a marathoner. And in those three years, she had run 50 marathons. Just remarkable. And she was an elite marathoner. And you know, she said, I had a double mastectomy, but who needed them? They just slowed me down anyway. <laughs> like, I love this woman. Uh, you know, that's just one story of many. I mean, in, in St. George, I don't know if you saw, uh, at about the four and a half hour mark, a guy was coming into the finish, and, and he was doing one of these. And it, the crowd, you know, is like, oh, can he do it? Can he do it? And right when he's going to cross the line, he just literally collapses. And it's just like this, oh, this huge sigh. And those of you who have run a marathon, you know they give you a chip for your shoe that kind of trips the line. So the, the guys start running out with a gurney to put him on this. And I see him kind of go. And I'm thinking, what is this guy going to do? I mean, he's going to. And he kind of gets this wiggle going, this worm thing. And he rolls over, thump, thump. And everyone's watching. And he just, like Michelangelo, extends his leg, his foot, across the finish line. He trips the trigger. He's like, beep. And there's this huge crowd. And yeah, everyone's exploded. And then they put him on the gurney and took him out. <laughs> so there are a lot of good stories, yeah. Hi, Dean. Uh, just another question kind of around the health aspects of this sort of running. I, I feel that you and a very small select group of people are part of kind of a uh, cohort that really pushes what the body can do in terms of endurance. And I'm just wondering if you ever have uh, requests from medical researchers, researchers to study you, I guess, and like, you know, look at to why you can kind of not feel pain or, you know, how your mus muscles have developed differently than other people. 
Uh, would a psychiatrist qualify? <laughs> Possibly, maybe a combination. <laughs> That's true. I've had a couple of psychiatrists contact me. <laughs> but um, they, you know, there was a, a, a medical research study done, dur done during the 50 marathon. So uh, a huh. group uh, from Colorado, from CU, uh, drew blood uh, throughout the 50 marathons, which oh, was, I'll tell you, having your blood drawn and then going running a marathon, not good. Yeah. yeah. But they were looking at, you know, was this a, a bad thing for my body? Was it a neutral thing? Was it potentially a good thing? Mm -hmm. And they were looking at a number of, of biomarkers, um, you know, one being something called the CPK, okay. which measures muscle destruction, essentially. And all of my biomarkers stayed within the normal range throughout the course of 50 days. So I never exceeded anything. <laughs> uh, I did become uh, just slightly anemic. They're saying you're trending towards slight anemia. I kept saying, yeah, you guys are drawing three vials of blood <laughs> out of my arm every day. Of course I'm getting anemic. Uh, but other than that, I, you know, I've never really been, you know, I've had my foot strike analyzed. Um, but other than that, I've never really been um, put through too much more. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Hi. Um, I more, read te in more text coming in? No, no, no. <laughs> this is my question now. Okay. So uh, I read uh, in a magazine, I, I forget which magazine, that you've uh, sworn off, like, ibuprofen and anti inflams and then have gone the herbal route. Uh, I'm just curious, could you tell us about your experience with that? I think Arnica is the one. Yeah, that Arnica, Montana. Yeah, yeah I, um, you know, I used to, like many runners and many athletes, I used to periodically pop ibuprofen. And um, I started popping more than I think I should. You know, I, I was you know, taking two or three a day sometimes during hard workout days. And I found that my recovery was OK. But, you know, I started reading some, some stuff saying, you know, ibuprofen m might be a double-edged sword that uh, it might actually um, hinder your recovery versus help it. And I think they, the same is going, you know, they're saying a, a lot about the uh, antioxidant vitamins as well. They're saying, you know, if you're popping megadoses, you're, you're hindering your body's natural response um, to free radicals. So don't do that. Uh, let your body respond naturally. So I just stopped cold turkey. I stopped taking ibuprofen. And I noticed almost immediately that it really hurt. <laughs> but eventually, uh, I, I realized that I didn't need it. And I was actually recovering quicker. And then when I was in Europe, um, the, you know, homeopathic remedies in Europe are really popular. And there's one called Arnica Montana that they use, uh, doctors use for um, swelling, muscle soreness. So periodically, I'll, I'll take an arnica, uh, um, arnica and just sublingual, so under your tongue. But again, it's, it's, a, it's a plant derivative, so it's all natural. It's not a drug. And I, I think it helps. I mean, maybe it's a little placebo effect, but it seems to help a little. But I, I really notice now, if I do take one ibuprofen, the, you know, the pain relief is pronounced because I rarely take it now, so maybe once every six months. But if I do take one, or before, you know, I, I think I'd build up a bit of a tolerance to them, and I had to take four or five before I got the same effect. Does that answer your question? Yeah, thanks. Okay. Um, yeah, I just wanted to ask, um, what's your diet like uh, on a typical day? I mean, I mean, what, what do you eat, and, and how many calories a day do you eat, and, and of those calories, what is it mostly that you, you eat? Um, okay. Do you eat mostly meat, or do you eat mostly vegetables, or? That's a good question. I'll, I'll tell you, I'll start by saying that um, I one time had a, uh, uh, my crew keep a log of the foods I ate during a 200 mile run I do. And in the course of uh, 46 hours and 17 minutes of, of nonstop running, I consumed roughly 28,000 calories. So those of you doing the math, that's about two weeks worth of food in just under two days of continuous running. I think the interesting side note, though, was that I burned about 34,000 calories in that same period. So I lost five pounds at the end of this 200-mile run. My next book's going to be a diet book. You know, you just <laughs> start running. You can eat whatever you want. <laughs> um, but my diet, you know, primarily now is, is pretty refined. I'm, I'm kind of following this thing that I coined the Neanderthal diet. So when I go to make my food choices, I kind of use the filter. Would, would Neanderthal man have access to this food? You know, grains, not refined grains, no. I mean, he didn't have bread. He couldn't mill. Uh, he couldn't cook grains or process grains. So I've tried to cut out all grains. Um, you know, things like ice cream, no. He wouldn't have uh, access to ice cream. I've really tried to scale back on refined sugar. 
no hook high fructose corn syrup whatsoever, no trans or hydrogenated fats whatsoever, and you know primarily monounsaturated fats through olive oil and things like avocado and nuts, and really um, lean meats, uh, raw vegetables and raw fruit. And when I can eat like that consistently, I just feel so much more energetic. And that's kind of where I've gone with my diet. Yeah. Then a follow-up question on your sleep habits. Um, so obviously during the, the marathon, you have different habits altogether. But how about on a regular day when you're in your normal routine in San Francisco? Um, what are your sleeping habits like? Um, that's the first question. Second question is then uh, when you're actually running, when do you actually start to sweat or feel pain? <laughs> you know, I, um, I taught myself or trained myself to sleep about four, four and a half hours a night. Last night it was about three hours, but um, it was really brutal at first. Uh, I, I set my alarm clock and I forced myself to get up after four hours. I wouldn't recommend driving to anyone after, if you're going to try this, but uh, after about a month, I noticed my body had adapted. That uh, before I used to sleep, you know, seven, eight hours, but a few of those were kind of restless, stirring, you know, thinking about things. Now it's just four solid hours of really deep sleep, and that seems to do the trick. So that's, I, that's what about, I sleep, about four to four and a half hours a night. Yeah, and your second question. Of course, my memory's gone, you know. Just on the, uh, when, when you're running typically, when does it start to feel a little bit more difficult for you? When do you start to sweat and kind of have to mentally push yourself a bit? Yes, usually, you know, at about a marathon. It's, yeah. After 26 months. After 26, yeah. Yeah, I, you know, it, it never even popped into my head that I don't get that tired that quickly until I did this 60-minutes um, interview, of all things, where I'd run 30 miles, and I came running into this, you know, this interview with Leslie Stahl, and she's like, God, you're not even, you don't even look tired. And I'm thinking, why would she even say that? Of course I'm not tired. I've only run 30 miles, I mean. <laughs> and then it hit me like, oh, yeah, well, most people would probably be kind of tired and sweaty here at this point. I was, yeah. Dean, we're about out of time, but thank you very much for coming to Google. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.